Hi, and welcome to this uh, rather unusual version of Frank and Mary here in Westboro. Uh, uh, as you know, my co-host is Shelby Marshall. She's on the other screen. We have been doing this show for, for a while now, for I think over a year, trying to talk to seniors about issues that are of real concern to them. Um, but we realize that what we should really be focusing on right now is what everybody is focusing on, which is really COVID-19 and, and how we deal with all of the stresses involved with dealing with COVID-19, especially if you're a senior. Uh, so we've started to try to, to, to redo the show. First of all, we're obviously uh, working remotely. I'm in my office in, in uh, Marlboro, Shelby in, in hers in uh, Westboro. We have a wonderful guest that Shelby has uh, invited on specifically to talk about these issues. Uh, and then at the kind of toward the end of the show, we'll talk some more, some about some more general issues that you might be wanting to consider while you're at home. Uh, and maybe talking a little bit about who else we might be having on in, in, uh, in uh, later editions of this. We're also thinking that we may be doing this show weekly for a while because the, the world is changing like daily uh, just to try to update people as, as all of this COVID-19, whatever it is, lockdown or whatever we're calling it, continues. So Shelby, wh whom do we have today? Well, good morning, and, Arthur. And, and and welcome on. Yeah, good morning and welcome uh, to all of our guests. Uh, appreciate uh, for you joining in and um, happy to be able to bring sort of this, these special additions, if you will, to the community. Um, we are really fortunate uh, to have on as our guest today, our Director of Public Health, Steve Bakari. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Shelby. Good morning, Arthur. Um, I asked, uh, we asked Arthur to come on, uh, Arthur, excuse me, we asked Steve to come on and uh, give us a timely update. Today is uh, the 25th of March, just for those that may be watching this on a delayed replay at some point. Um, and uh, asked Steve to uh, give us an update. I do want to commend our all of our staff at the um, uh, in town departments and all of their direct reports for the unbelievable job that they're doing to uh, keep us safe and keep us informed. And um, Steve has really been uh, <laughs> thrown into uh, a, a huge learning curve around this, as we all have, and, and appreciate um, his um, his help. Um, so, Steve, let's get right into it. Um, uh, you've been updating the Board of Selectmen um, uh, and others on a regular basis. Um, last night we had a great meeting. I would encourage viewers to watch that meeting. Again, that was the meeting on the 24th. Uh, you can watch it on replay on Westboro TV. Um, but Steve, give us an update today of uh, Denver diagnosed cases in town, please. Sure. So, uh, you know, as of today, we have three confirmed cases. Um, those are people who have tested positive and are being isolated. Um, all three of those cases are uh, recovering well in their houses. Um, we don't have any hospitalizations as far as I know at this point. Um, so we have three right now. Now, uh, one thing people get a little bit confused, can get confusing is that the terminology sometimes. So we use the term, terminology isolation and then quarantine kind of intermittently together, but they, they do have a different uh, meaning. Isolation is someone who's actually been, is actually sick with symptoms. Um, it could be someone who tests positive, or it could be someone who may be a close contact to someone who has tested positive that we're assuming uh, is, uh, you know, positive for that disease. So when I talk about numbers, I mean, we have three confirmed cases, but we also have uh, two people who are uh, symptomatic that are um, uh, close contacts to people who have been positive. So we're treating those people as positive. They're in isolation right now. Uh, again, they're in their houses, you know, relatively comfortable um, in recovering. So um, Steve, you mentioned a term that I've become familiar with now, but I think our viewers should understand this whole term of close contact. So talk to our viewers a little bit about that. What does that mean? Sure, so uh, uh, the way the state has asked us to interpret a close contact is from the date that a case becomes symptomatic, a close contact would be someone that they've had interaction with while they're symptomatic uh, within six feet and what they say is for a prolonged period of time. The 15 minutes has kind of been thrown out there, but there's no, yeah. you, you got to kind of work your way through some of this stuff, but that's the definition. Um, so uh, if people that are worried about, uh, you know, contracting uh, a coronavirus, uh, that's kind of what we use as the, 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 the of, of how we track back uh, contacts to, to people. 
So let me just pause just so our viewers really understand that. So if if you are at home right now and uh, many of our uh, seniors, you know, they're couples, they're caring for each other and there's an individual who is symptomatic, um, fever, coughing, difficulty breathing. Steve, anything else you want to add to that? Uh, those are the main ones uh, okay. uh, right now that uh, there's some others being kicked around, but that's kind of still what CDC and DPH are using as, you know, the, the bellwether um, symptoms. Yep. And, and and in terms of fever, well, I'll talk about kind of that in, in a moment, but if you are with someone that is symptomatic, um, uh, again, close contact could be you've probably been in close contact with that person, but if they're even if they're not excuse me, if they're symptomatic, um, that close contact could have been a couple minutes if they've sneezed, you know, you got to kind of consider it even if it was a couple minutes. So it, um, I, I wouldn't use the benchmark of 15 minutes if, if um, would you agree? Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, in, in all these cases, the household, household contacts are generally considered close contacts no matter what. So uh, those household contacts are put into quarantine, which okay. is than isolation. Quarantine is someone who has no symptoms, is healthy, and uh, but we're worried about them developing uh, symptoms over a period of time. And generally, quarantine is for 14 days. Yep. If someone is put into quarantine, we do we do monitor those people. We call them every day. We ask them to take their temperature twice a day. Uh, ask them for respiratory symptoms. So we do monitor that throughout the full 14 days, and if at the end of that time period, uh, temperature's fine, respiratory problems are fine, then we release them from quarantine. So so if a person is symptomatic, they have not been tested, what would your advice be to uh, that person? Yeah. I, I think the, the, the best advice we can give right now is call your primary care physician as far as what they think is best for you. Um, you know, they can get you tested. Uh, a lot of the testing sites still need um, you know, uh, approval from the doctor to get you in there. So that, that's kind of what we're telling people right now is if uh, obviously your primary care physician knows your health history and all that too, a lot more information than I would know. Uh, but, you know, please reach out to your uh, doctor if you think uh, you need to be tested or that you may have, you know, may have it. Sure. So, and, and I think that's important because we're hearing more and more. You can't turn the news on without hearing about more testing available, um, which is what we're, as a result, we're going to see the number of positive cases rise. It's just uh, uh, how, how that cycle is going to work. Um, but folks cannot just go and say, I want to be tested. It has to be ordered by a physician. I think that's important for folks to understand. So you're calling your primary care physician, talking about the symptoms that you're experiencing is going to be your best kind of first step toward uh, in that process. Yes, that's correct. And, and, and Steve, can you tell us, so what is, what is the closest test site if people are going to be tested? Uh, I, I, I don't have, the, uh, often the people being shuttled to where like they're, they have an affiliation with their doctors. So, uh, I, I think UMass Memorial is testing. I think there's a testing site in Shrewsbury near CVS, but I think that's only for first responders. So uh, there's numerous sites around, but some may not be open to everyone. So um, I'd rather not give out too much information. I'm not sure they all service the same group of people. Right. So, 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 the, oh, sorry, so people should really be asking their physician to, to figure right. that out. Yep. Okay. So, um, let's kind of go forward to uh, a little bit about what's happening behind the scenes from your lens, um, Steve. Um, I think the public sort of wants to understand that. I know I certainly have received questions around well, what happens when there is a positive test for someone who lives here in Westboro. What's the role of the Board of Selectmen? Sure, sure. So, uh, if a resident of Westboro tests positive, we receive a uh, notification of that through an online system, which we, we, we've been a part of for many years. It's not only for uh, coronavirus, but for any communicable disease that someone in town would test positive for. We get notification. And so what we would do is reach out to that, that resident, um, you know, obviously tell them that they have to stay in isolation. And then we do a thorough our interview as far as contacts within the time period where they were symptomatic, right? So uh, we'd ask for, you know, primarily household contacts, usually pretty easy to, to, to find out. But you know, you're also worried about 
potential work contacts if they were at work while they were symptomatic and there were people, you know, in the vicinity of where they work, um, or other contacts if they went to some kind of gathering, things like that. Uh, we'd be asking for that information. If we did compile a group of uh, names, we would uh, reach out to those people. If they are in another town, we would notify that Board of Health and they would do the reaching out to those people for quarantine. Um, so uh, that, that's in a nutshell kind of how it works. And then as I said before, once someone is either isolated or quarantined, we do follow up with those people throughout the uh, whole uh, period of whatever uh, whatever period of time they need to be quarantined for, so or isolated. So we're calling them on a daily basis, you know, making sure that symptoms aren't getting worse, that sort of thing. Sure. Okay. So, Good. so, so Steve, as it as this relates to kind of inter inter community, so if you've got someone here who is tested positive. Um, and, and, and you've got a list of people, and some of those people are from out of town, you're actually going through that town's board of, that town's health department, and that town is, is, is reaching out? Correct, so we, we, you know, we, we, we can uh, share our cases with the uh, appropriate people in, the, in other towns as far as uh, if they have residents there. So uh, again, this is all confidential. The boards of health have been doing this for a right. long time, but you know, if there was someone in Marlboro, I could, I could share my case with the Marlboro health nurse uh, and let her know who that person is and where they live, contact information, and they would be responsible to reach out to that person to quarantine them based upon the information we give them. I see. So, uh, Steve, can you just um, go a little deeper in terms of the privacy piece? Because, you know, one of the natural questions if, you know, for folks living here in town, they're like, oh my God, we have three cases. Where does the person live? Where have they been? Why isn't the Board of Health giving us more specific information about that person? And there is that thing called HIPAA and um, it's for good reasons. Yeah, and we can kind of try to walk a fine line with that. We want to get information out about, you know, to people who we think is needed, but we don't want to give out so much information in a town like Westboro where maybe you could actually figure out who it was, especially when the caseload is so low right now. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if we get hundreds of cases, well, then it's a, a little, little tougher to see who it is. But um, we, we are going to start publishing uh, bi week to twice a week reports. Uh, we talked about that last night with the Board of Selectmen on uh, things like uh, number of confirmed cases, uh, if those people were housed that, you know, if they were in, the, in their home recovering or in the hospital. Uh, uh, who has come off of the isolation and quarantine list, not who, but numbers. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to, I think, look at also you, at some point, maybe maybe publishing something according to precincts so where people, you know, so we could, but we're not that, we, right. we don't have numbers right now to make that an effective analysis tool. I don't think I think that was kind of decided last night. So, you know, we, we, age, we can give out the ages of people. Um, uh, but, you know, we really want to try to protect people's health at this, uh, privacy at this time. Mm -hmm. And not give out too much, and right. uh, especially since the cases are so low, um, it, it's it's a, it's a balancing act. I understand people's concern. Right, but I think the important point is is that once a person has tested positive, the public should understand that um, Board of Health is monitoring those individuals. They are either in isolation or quarantine, depending upon symptomatic, asymptomatic, close contact, etc. And and they are staying home, so they are not sort of out and about in in the world potentially infecting other people correct so what i would tell people is if you are worried about being exposed um if you exact if you fit the model of someone who is a close contact to someone who is positive you should have been contacted by the board of health if you have not been contacted then uh you are not considered a close contact and at least from a, a direct contact perspective you are not a uh, you know don't have to be quarantined or isolated Okay. And, and for folks that um, work in Westboro but don't live here or for employers that are here, um, employers may or may not be contacted by the Westboro Board of Health if, let's say, someone lives in Hudson and they test positive, but through the interview by the Board of Health in Hudson, um, it's determined, you know, yes, they're positive, but they haven't been working, let's say, for two weeks, right? And they've been home for whatever reason, working from home. Um, there's a pretty good chance in this limited scenario that your office wouldn't be contacted. So if I, they were my employee, I wouldn't ever be notified of that individual, correct? Correct. Yeah, we, we're probably not going to know of every workplace where there is an employee that tested positive just because, you know, a lot of the workspaces have a lot, of, you know, out, people from outside of the uh, outside of Westboro working in them. So, um, you know, that could certainly happen, Shelby. Yep. Yep. 
Arthur, do you have uh, any other questions for um, uh, Steve? I have one more, just with regard to our first responders. No, I think I just think it's 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 great through you, Steve, to have people really be getting an understanding of what's kind of really going on, right? It, on a day to day basis, it's just terrific. Yeah, and we're here to answer questions. A phone doesn't really stop that often <laughs> nowadays. Uh, it's on mute right now, so you don't. Have to <laughs> Uh, so I, I will get back to you if you have a question. Just to, please be patient. Sometimes you're working from home and I'm getting the voicemails or, you know, sometimes you're going to be put in a queue. But um, you know, I do call everyone back. So if you have a question, you know, give me a call. I'll try to answer it the best I can. Okay. Um, Steve, just a quick question with respect to our first responders. They are our first line of defense, fire, EM, EMTs, and police. Um, um, even... Um, um, well, DPW aren't first responders, but they are essential workers in many ways. Um, but for our first responders, what um, what precautions are they taking? Can you talk a little bit about the sure. screening? Sure. Well, I know that right now uh, the fire department, if you if you were to call for ambulance service, um, they would screen you for you know symptoms and also I think travel history right now. Um, so if you were to tell them, hey, I got a fever, respiratory symptoms, they would take personal precautions when they show up. My understanding is obviously the EMTs will have uh, you know the proper precautions, which I think is mask, gloves, maybe a face shield. That I'm not mm -hmm. totally sure, sure what the right it is. And I believe they are, if, if you are, have those symptoms, they are putting a mask on you also as the uh, uh, patient um, and then for, for transport. So that, that they, that's one of the precautions they're taking right now. Right. And, and just for folks that if a loved one is transported, um, there's a very good chance that you as the loved one cannot accompany them um, as you might normally do in your own vehicle to go to the hospital because so many of the hospitals have um, shut down visitors. So um, that would be something that perhaps uh, the EMTs could, you know, provide you with, with advice about. Um, and maybe that's a, a question for our next show, Arthur, is, you know, how does that happen, right? Because we have a loved one going to the hospital, the first instinct is to follow them. But uh, right. that's that's being severely limited right now. So right, that'd be, right. that's a great idea. Um, Steve, um, thank you for your time. Uh, we'll let you get back to that queue that's probably building. Um, really appreciate all the work you're doing and uh, that you continue to be a resource to the public. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right. Have a great day. Bye. Steve, a real pleasure. Bye-bye. Uh, and so we're back. Um, Without this, without Steve Bakari, and and once again, we just both really want to thank Steve for uh, coming on to the show. I think so many people are are trying to figure this out. You know, you, you see it all on TV, and you see it at the macro level, but to actually try to figure out what's going on. You know, are you safe? You know, are you? If you see one of your neighbors out, can you feel safe? That you know, to, so to actually understand what that system is, and from the perspective of people's privacy knowing that if there is a problem, you're not necessarily going to become like a target in the neighborhood right. because everybody kind of knows that you've got an issue or thinks that you have an issue. So this was really great. So, so Shelby. So, on a, yeah, on a so call. Arthur, you know, you know, one of the things we've talked about on uh, previous shows is the, the healthcare proxy. And I have to believe that now more than ever, um, it's important that folks have their uh, documents, their legal documents, particularly the healthcare proxy in place. Can you talk to our viewers a little bit about that and how could they quickly do that if they don't have one? Right. So once again, kind of quickly, um, most people that I speak to, most seniors, as opposed <clears throat> to the general population, have a healthcare proxy. They have done it. Um, it's someplace. They just may not know necessarily where that is, right? And how long ago they did it. So, so if, if I were, if, when I'm advising seniors right now, I really kind of talk about first of all, it, if you've done a healthcare proxy, go find it, right? Go find it. it ch chances are it's in this pile of documents, someplace that you put it, right? And if you can't find it, go talk to your lawyer because chances are your lawyer has a copy of it, or talk to your doctor so that you make sure that it's available because what the last thing you need is to have an emergency and to be needing to go to the hospital and maybe you're incapacitated, right? And that's why you're going, right? And you get to, they get to the hospital and, then, and no one knows who to talk to, 
because you're incapacitated and there, and everything just gets frozen up. That's the last thing you need right now, right? So you want to have that healthcare proxy. You want to have it available, right? You might even want to put it on your refrigerator, but you at least want to have it. Have it. Ideally, you also want to have your doctor have this, right? Because if you're if you're if you're if you don't have it with you, right? Um, then at least if you, you you know you get to the hospital, the doc you know if you, if the if the the hospitals can get a sense of who your attending physician is, mm -hmm. they're going to be able to reach out to that doctor. The doctors are going to be able to get the information to them. Great. Point. So that's the first. But but at least as important as, as this, I'm always talking to people who say they've they'll say, well, have you got your healthcare proxy? Well, yes. Well. Have you talked to your person about how you want to be treated if there's an emergency? Well, often the answer is not so much, right? So this is the time finally, right? To, you know, I'm sure that if you've got, if your spouse is your proxy, I shouldn't say I'm sure, chances are you really have had a conversation with them about kind of how you would want to be treated if this were an emergency, because this could be an emergency. As you know, yeah. people die from this. You know, not a lot of people, but people die from this, right, quickly, right, or, you know, over short periods of time. So if, if there's someone that, 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 that's going to be making decisions for you, they need to be knowing what kind of decisions they want to be making. So if it's your spouse, that's one thing, especially if it's one of your children, right, yeah. or if your child has been the backup, so you never really thought you needed to talk to them. Well, you know, it's time to talk to them and to give them a sense of, you know, of, of if there's an emergency, if yep. you're in the hospital, if there are certain treatments that the doctors are recommending, how should you be responding, right? What are the things that are really important to you at this stage in your life? Maybe you're right now extremely healthy and you're not worried about any of this. Maybe you're not so healthy. So you need to be having those conversations, right? And now is the time. So that's kind of the message. Okay. So, so Shelby, now I want to ask you, right? Because you've, you've, <laughs> You do this for a living, yeah. right? You yeah. help. You take care of people. You're taking yep. care of people all the time, right? You've got. I've got. We've got all these people who are really stressing out. Yeah. Can you just kind of talk about for 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 individuals what they should be doing to take care of themselves, and especially for caregivers? What can what should you be doing right now? Right? Sure. I mean, I I keep talking to clients about just you know this is just a real good time to call that elderly aunt that you haven't spoken to, you know, who lives by herself yeah. and is freaked out, you know? Yeah. But can you just talk about that a little bit? I sure. Really, they're really important issues. So I think it's important now than ever, ironically enough, that, um, you know, with social, social distancing, we actually need to be virtually or telephonically reaching out to um, folks to just check in on them. So I think that that's very important. I know that that's happening in the community. Um, but um, I mean, even if even if uh, you have an elderly neighbor and you don't know their phone number, you know, drop a note off at their door in a plastic bag, you know, just thinking of you, if you need anything, here's my number, please call. Um, because folks, some people might be too afraid to just go out and go grocery shopping. Um, and so maybe you can help them uh, with that. Um, but from a practical perspective, uh, what we've been talking to our families about, and certainly our caregivers, um, who, families who are caregivers and our professional caregivers, there's some really practical things that you can do in your home, even if even if you don't have an army of Clorox uh, wipes or hand sanitizers. So number one, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Um, maintain social distancing in your home if a person is symptomatic in any sort of ways, but the practical nature is sometimes couples are providing care for each other. So if you have to go and help someone get out of bed, you've got to be physically touching. There is no social uh, distancing in that situation. So if the person is symptomatic, have them, you probably don't have a mask at home, that's okay. You know, uh, a bandana covering the nose and the mouth um, is, um, even if it's this kind of thing um, with the person holding, you know, if you don't have a way to kind of bring it around your whole face. Um, and um, then when you're done with that, guys, I'm sorry, the handkerchief is the worst thing that was ever invented. That goes and it goes in the laundry. It doesn't go in your pocket because it's a you know, piece of cloth, but it can be washed. It doesn't have to be thrown away. 
Um, if you're worried about the telephone, right, you're worried about using your phone, someone may have touched it, take a, a piece of uh, a paper towel and cover it over. Um, so your you know, face is touching the paper towel, that's a completely appropriate and safe barrier. And then when you're done with the phone, wash your hands, wash your hands, soap and water. If you don't have a bunch of alcohol wipes or even isopropyl alcohol, 60% alcohol, don't worry about it. Soap and water is like one of the best things that you can do. Keep surfaces clean in particular. You can wash all your clothes uh, with the other person's clothes, even if they're, um, they're, they're positive or symptomatic. So that's not an issue. Um, just wash them as normal. You don't have to do anything special. You don't have to throw clothes out. Um, uh, just, you know, be practical. But um, I do want to make sure in the time that we have uh, remaining, just got a document here from the town. I want to refer to it um, that um, please don't take your wipes, your, um, you know, if you're using um, baby wipes or Clorox wipes or any sort of wipes and put them in the toilet. Um, every day we have our DPW staff that goes out and check what are fascinating pieces of equipment called sewer grinders. Um, the grinders take all the stuff that goes down through our sewer and grinds it up. And um, it, those wipes, even when they say they're disposable, are not good for the system. So throw them away. Please don't flush them because the one thing we don't need are sewer problems on top of what we already have. Um, um, if you are um, at home and you need assistance, um, um, I use the grocery shopping as an example. Call the senior center. They are taking calls. They are available to help. And there's an army of volunteers waiting in the wings to help folks um, with errands and in, in doing what needs to be done. The senior center number is 508 366 3000. That's 508 366 3000. If you're just not sure, call them. If nothing else, you're going to get a friendly voice on the phone who's going to ask how you're doing. And you can also be on a call check in list. Um, um, and I last I knew that number was about 150 people they were calling and checking in on regularly. Which is like a huge deal. A yeah. huge deal. Yeah. There's one other one other thing, just going going back to some of your questions, Shelby. So there's a there's a a, a mass.gov, the mass.gov website. Yep. If you want to download a healthcare proxy, you can go to that website, right? Or, you know, talk to your lawyer or talk to your doctor. They're going to have these documents available, right? So if you hadn't done it to yep. this point, you want to try to get one, right? Or have one of your kids drop one out, just have it available. It's just really, really important. Great. So, so Shelby, uh, you yeah. know, I think, you know, we were talking about a whole bunch of different possible guests that we want to be having sure. on. I guess I would just suggest to people, Kind of stay tuned. We really appreciate the help of, of Aiden and Karen and the other folks uh, at Westbro Cable for being willing to do this because yeah. we think we know there are a lot of people who who don't have a lot of access. Right? There's no print media anymore. This is we're trying to make this a good way for you to stay in touch with all the things you can be doing to protect yourself here in Westbro. So thank you very very much for watching. Thank you, Shelby. Thank you, Let's Aiden, see. who nobody else can see but we can and. <laughs> Uh, we'll look forward to see you on the next installment of uh, Frank and Mary here in Westville. Bye, you. everyone. Be safe. Bye.